If you're in art school now, or you've been in art school before, you've been told to get this book. Oh, hold on a second. Let me get the cover. You've been told to get this book, the Bridgman book. So you go to Amazon, you get on there, you order it, you get it to your door, you open the package, you open the book, and I'm confused. Well, what am I supposed to do? All these lines and grids and things. How am I supposed to study from all of this? To answer this question, let's start with some origins. Bridgman sailed off to France to study with Jean-Léon Jérôme of the Orientalist movement and one of the greatest painters of his time. He painted many historic paintings and famous pictures like this one. His drawing technique is indicative of the French school of realism for that time, with hatching as the primary drawing method, reflecting upon the concepts of the Renaissance artists. And as you'll later see, a big influence on the way George Bridgman draws all of his images. The Renaissance method of drafting uses two tools to turn form, contour and value. Value is a given, light and dark, but contour is developed over the surface using hatch lines. Similar to a wire mesh, you have the long form, the short form, and the direction of the light. George's shorthand includes heavy hatch lines, much broader or bolder than the typical finely rendered ones because he's teaching and so he's kind of showing you the way to do it but not exactly how to do it. So his lines are going to be much, much thicker and much heavier but they're still going to look like they turn in the right direction. His other method is to use heavy dark lines for shadows and thinner lines for the lights. So in these arms you can kind of see a much heavier darker volume and in these drawings a much heavier darker volume including the shading that he's doing but the outlines themselves are bold where the light is absent and much thinner where the light is present. With these tools and the new challenge of industry in front of him, George developed a revolutionary method for training the modern artist. Bridgman taught during the Industrial Revolution, the boom in productivity, a world of factories, machines, inventions, child labor, and apparently a whole lot of it by all these photos. Well, anyway, the arts reflected this shift in the world. Human was a perfect machine, crafted, cut, and sculpted into this modern era. With all these new inventions for printing, an entire army was needed to cover the interiors and all of the artwork that was necessary for them, from newspapers and advertisements to magazines of every sort, women's journals, sports magazines, um, the novel the Western, the pulp, and so many other types of novels that were never yet before available. Bridgman's books have been republished too many times to count since their first release, but they will always and forever be written in complete chaos because they were never written by him. He had passed away before he'd ever written anything to completion. So the books we have are a result of his students gathering up their notes using his sketches from his sketchbooks, their tracings from class, and these massive epic demonstrations that he did over his head using a six foot stick with a piece of charcoal or chalk attached to it, drawing so that his entire class of 65 plus students could see what he was doing. Man, that's pretty impressive. Understanding the backstory is context clues that'll help us make better sense of why his drawings are drawn the way they are and what we're looking for in them in the first place. That's why I included that information in the beginning of the video. And now to shine some light on what the Bridgman book actually covers. Number one, skeletal design. Bridgman breaks the skeleton down into organic drawings and mechanical machinated drawings, relating the bones to mechanical function like the hinges he's drawn here to make the point this arm has a hinge joint in it. Also, he's showing the rotation of the bones, the supinator and the pronator, but um, he's drawing things using these mechanical parts to explain his concepts. And if you notice, he's also building with walls and edges so you can see the perspective of all the bones. Muscle design. Prior to his teaching, most anatomy classes were taught in a medical science format, 
very real and sometimes indiscernible when copying a cadaver. He was teaching muscle origins. He was teaching shape design, shape language. He was doing something very different. He was stylizing the muscles into sculptural shapes rather than the realistic organic forms that they were. And he was creating a map or a geometry for people to copy so that they could memorize it as a formula. Number three, planes of the figure. Throughout his book, there are breakout drawings or cross-section drawings that reveal geometry of the forms. He's describing the planes of the fleshed over anatomy. While some of the shapes might appear over-exaggerated, if we don't begin with that exaggeration as a means of idealization, then the forms don't really have a standard we can memorize. Developing a flat shape into a form is not easy unless you are already familiar with it and have seen or drawn that volume from various angles. Drawing cross sections helps the imagination understand the total volume, its curves, and its walls. This book has cross sections spread out all throughout the contents, and sometimes they can be difficult to spot as cross sections. Marginal drawings and what might appear as stray lines are also parts of the complex roadmaps Bridgman has drawn out for us to follow. A big part of memorizing these systems for the figure is memorizing these cross sections, something I'll discuss more in depth in another video. If you don't know how to see it, then it'll pass you right by. Bridgman's sketch style can be elusive, but the hatching on the forms is shading and shorthand. If you tighten up the lines, you get perfect patches of tone, and the hatch lines help emphasize directional movement and flow with the figure in space. It's also a brief glimpse into the mind of Jean-Léon Jerome and the French academic process of form. It's been around as long as Michelangelo, but Bridgman put it down on paper. In its mechanical design structure, rhythm is in every stroke of every one of his drawings. He also shows us a visual concept of opposites, opposite rhythms, opposite forms, or contrasting rhythms and contrasting forms. Dynamics even modern sculptors today have utilized from his teachings. He also shows that regardless of how much rhythm you put into the figures, there's still a balance of rhythm and structure through the bones. And these rhythms of these bones are triangulated to each other, especially in the core of the torso, as seen in this particular example. I touched on it briefly, but it deserves its own category. Of all the tools that Bridgman has given us here, his greatest, single greatest contribution to the study of the human form was to machinate the parts or to compare the human to the machine, showing intent and purpose in the construction of the skeletal and the muscle systems. And it fits that he would do it living in the glory of the industrial age. Sometimes these graphs might be a little confusing because they have anatomy attached to them as well, to these mechanical parts, but that is what he's trying to do is isolate one little area and then bring it back to the rest of the figure to help you understand its mechanism in context to the human form. When you practice from the book, try not to directly copy the drawings. Translate them in your own hand and learn from what he has created. Pay attention, cross-reference, and stay curious as to what each of the drawings represents and why. Here's a sped-up demo of a process breakdown page from the book. The steps include the skeleton, the muscles, the mechanics, and the volumes.
If you like the information in this video, please share it, like it, or both. I'd gladly appreciate the quick and simple support. And subscribe to Lemonade.com for more videos, tools, and training. Thanks for watching.